Good evening, I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Tom McNutt, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you all for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe and WBUR. First, congratulations are in order. Kevin Cullen was recently awarded the American Society of News Editors prestigious Batten Medal for <laughs> for his inspiring storytelling and commitment to ordinary people. Having won the award in 2008, he's the only person to have, have ever won it twice. And we also congratulate Kevin and his co-author Shelley Murphy for their groundbreaking and fascinating new book, Whitey Bulger, America's Most Wanted Gangster and the Manhunt That Brought Him to Justice. Kevin and Shelley are both award-winning journalists, earning respectively a Pulitzer Prize and the George Polk Award. They're both known for their deep roots in the city neighborhoods of Savin Hill and Southie where they were born, their tireless pursuit and unflinching pursuit of the truth, and their clear, gripping writing, and of course, for their fierce Boston accents. The latter being most appropriate in a building which honors a man who brought this city's native dialect to a world stage. My favorite example is the speech in which JFK invoked the great Cuban revolutionary Jose Marti by stating, and as Marty said, our moderator this evening is David Boweri, one of the very few who can match Kevin and Shelley's investigative reporting on the FBI and Whitey Bulger. David is currently... Absolutely. ...a senior reporter for WBUR, and who could ever forget his recent gripping radio report on the coerced murder confession of a 16-year-old girl from Worcester. I had to stop driving my car as I listened to it. This new account of Whitey Bulger is, in part, a social history of Boston and touches, at times, on the role the Kennedy family has played in the life and politics of this city. As a crime story, it also affirms the importance of an active and well-financed local news organization and impartial judicial court system. We're often honored to host naturalization ceremonies in this hall where immigrants are sworn in as new citizens by federal judges, including two who play a role in this saga, the first is Judge Mark Wolf, whose courageous rulings reveal the extent of Whitey Bulger's corrupt, corrupt relationship with the FBI. And the second is one of the newest judges on the federal bench. At her first naturalization ceremony here a few months ago, she requested on a subsequent visit if she could have a guided tour of our museum. We provided one to her last month as she reimmersed herself into the history of the Kennedy presidency, the struggle for civil rights, and JFK's call for each of us to serve our country. Her name is Denise Casper. She's the first African-American woman to sit on the federal bench in Massachusetts, and she was recently named to oversee the trial of Whitey Bulger. Kevin wrote a column about that selection last week, and I'll allow him to add his own editorial comments about that later in the conversation. Let's get right to it. Please join me now in welcoming Shelley Murphy, Kevin Cullen, and David Boweri to the Kennedy Library. I just want to point out, this is the only time you'll find me to the right of WBUR. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, not only right to the now. Kennedy Library, but to the longest-running saga in our lifetimes, and really one of the longest-running sagas in the modern era. I call this... The case, that never, the case that never ends, the crime that never stops. From the beginning of the New Deal to the end of the New Frontier was a tale of 30 years. This story is a tale of 37 years if you simply consider Whitey Bulger's involvement in government work, if not in public service. <laughs> You know, this is a saga, all right. Um, and just like the sagas of old, we even have Icelandic names in this one, like <laughs> Anna Bjorn's daughter. Pretty good. But it's 
much more than a, it's much more than a crime story. And it's a story about much more than one man. Which, which, which really makes it a story. And it, there couldn't be a more appropriate place to tell the story tonight, this saga, than at the Kennedy Library. Because, in fact, although it won't be noted, this is the 50th anniversary of the War on Organized Crime. And the War on Organized Crime was launched for several reasons that had to do both with the zeal of Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General at the time, and of the animosity between the Kennedy brothers and John Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover had always denied the existence of organized crime. And to Hoover, if he didn't know something about something, then it didn't exist. And he was embarrassed in the late 1950s by the fact that there was organized crime. And it was Bobby Kennedy who compounded his embarrassment. So when Bobby Kennedy became Attorney General, suddenly the war began with a zeal against the enemy within, as Bobby Kennedy had titled his book on organized crime. In 1960, in the main office of the FBI, there were 400 people in New York City looking for communists and 10 looking at organized crime. That all changed with Bobby Kennedy. And it was no surprise, therefore, that the, that the war was launched here in Boston, because this was going to be the showcase. And this was the first place where the FBI declared mission accomplished. But when you have zeal to fight enemies, often that leads to ruthlessness, and ruthlessness can lead to the bending of laws, cutting corners. And so the irony here, as we come to talk really about the end of the war on crime, is that you have bookends. And one side, the early bookends, involved the first star in the war on organized crime, a legendary FBI agent, Paul Rico, who would die in jail decades later awaiting trial on charges of helping Whitey Bulger to murder people. And the first starring witness for the government to the war on organized crime was a guy named Joe Barbosa, who was protected by the government and turned out to be a notorious liar and a murderous witness. And on this side, this bookend, the other end, you have the second star in the war on organized crime, FBI agent John Conley, convicted of helping Whitey Bulger murder someone. And of course, there is the other star, starring witness for the government, Whitey Bulger himself, who has become the emblem of a war on crime that turned dirty. And so you have bookends. We start tonight with the figure of Bulger, who is really the emblem of so much that went wrong here in Boston uh, on the eve of his trial for 19 murders. So the tale begins, the saga starts, and I am thrilled and honored and privileged to be on the stage tonight with Shelley and Kevin. Thank you. So, I'm so struck. You know, the way you set that up was perfect because I'm so struck by, you know, when you look back how much animosity the FBI had for Malcolm X, and yet when it came to going after the mafia under J. Edgar Hoover and people like Rico, they adopted Malcolm X's great ethos, which is by any means necessary. Uh, and Paul Rico, did exactly what he thought Hoover wanted him to do, and that was play God. And we have a section in the book in which the FBI decides when there's the, the Irish gang wars blazing in the early 60s, the FBI decides who is going to win. And the FBI, in the person of Paul Rico, gets people killed. He decides who would die. 
He decides who will win. And it was so Machiavellian that Paul Rico decided that Stevie Flemmy, one of his informants, who will later become the uh, partner in crime with Whitey, was so valuable to them that he gets him to switch sides. Steve Flemmy is taken from one gang and more or less moved over to the Winter Hill Gang because the FBI had, had decided the Winter Hill Gang will win. And they will decide what... And the other thing about the, the corruption that began, and that's, this book, to me, is, is, it's many stories, but it's a story of institutional corruption. And the FBI um, decided at that point that they could pick who would win, and they would also have no problem with being complicit in murders. So what John Conley did in the 70s with Whitey Bulger was a template that existed in the 60s. And obviously, Bobby Kennedy didn't sign up for this. Uh, but he inadvertently unleashed a monster, which was the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. And a, a guy like, like Rico, and, and, the, and you can't make this stuff up, Paul Rico arrested Whitey Bulger in 1956. That's why they call it a saga. <laughs> <laughs> in a nightclub in, in Revere where an informant would told him he was waiting. So you can't make this stuff up, but we did. Shelly, we, uh, so if the curtains were open, we could see the old town. Take, take us back, if you would, to the old town, or up to Old Colony Avenue in the 1950s, really which becomes, it, it's, it's the decade in which Whitey becomes a full-time criminal. But take us back to the, to the town that existed then, a fundamentally different place than it is now, profoundly, and before, of course, the troubles of the 1970s. But I wonder if you could just kind of paint the picture of what Selfie was like. Well, I mean, loyalty, you know, uh, neighborhood, um, people hanging out on their stoops. I mean, a place where everybody knew everybody. Um, and, you know, Whitey describes his childhood in very different terms than Billy describes it. I mean, Billy Bulger talks it about South Boston in very nostalgic terms, um, about kids playing tag out in the courtyard or, um, you, know, um, just, you know, games at, at the park or down at the beach. And Whitey talks about um, being poor and um, wanting more and being sort of angry, you know, and he describes it in terms of um, you know, stealing and um, being sort of wild and, and getting caught stealing and being threatened by a police officer who put a gun in his mouth. So um, his view of the neighborhood, it, it does come back to sort of a neighbor taking care of neighbor. Um, one thing Kevin and I talked about for the book is that in, in, in South Boston, you know, Whitey very carefully cultivated a reputation early uh, that he was one of the first people in the neighborhood to have a car and he got that incredible. car from stealing. <laughs> um, but but that, that what he did with that car is he would, he would drive around and if he saw some of the elderly women, you know, carrying, lugging their groceries, like uh, Mrs. Moakley, um, he would stop and pick them up and cultivated this reputation mm. that in the neighborhood, they weren't talking about, oh, that Jimmy is driving a stolen car. They would say, what a nice young man. He stopped and Jimmy picked Balls me up. Jimmy Bulge is such a nice It's interesting man. Because, because I've talked to people who say that uh, Jean, his older sister, was the best dressed girl in school. And it was because he was in the back of trucks. <laughs> exactly. Pulling, pulling goods off. But Kevin, tell me, it was, it was much more tribal. Yeah. It was much more tribal. Uh, not that there weren't other, other ethnic groups, but it was certainly tribal. Church was a lot stronger. Big time. View of government. These were new dealers. Absolutely. Solid new dealers, blue collar, blue collar people. Union people. And the other thing about Southie, I always say that it's, figure, it's literally a peninsula. It's figuratively an island. It thinks of itself as separate. And if you look at the, if you look at the geography of Southie, if you're not from there, there's no reason to go through there. And that was fine by people from Southie. They didn't need it. Because if you look at it, I mean, it's, it's waterfront. It's, it's, it is a beautiful place. It really is. And it has a, a lot of great history. And, but I think it, it's interesting when I looked at when we were doing the research for the book before we really started writing it, I was surprised. I thought it was more Irish. 
there are a lot of Lithuanians, a lot of Poles, a lot of, a lot of Eastern Europeans, Latvians, and obviously there was an Italian population there. But it was, I'll, I'll never forget, when Bruce Bowling became the first African-American uh, president of the city council, the first thing he did was punish a rival. And so they had a reception for him up at the Parkman House, and I sidled up to him, and I put my arm around him. I said, Bruce, a brother finally gets the job, and what do you do? You act like an Irish Paul. <laughs> and he put his arm around me. He said, Kevin, in this town, we're all Irish by osmosis. <laughs> and Southie was like that. The ethos was Irish. So you could be an Armenian, but you had to sing Irish songs in the public schools. You know, and, and the other thing that, that I think is uh, running through the, the theme of this book um, is that it's an Irish story. And there is obviously nothing worse in the Irish consciousness, given the history of the Irish and its relationship with uh, the colonizer that was Britain. Informers were the bane of Irish history. Every time the Irish were about to break away or were trying to break away, an informer brought them down. And that's the great irony in this story, that Whitey became an informer who says he's not an informer. He says he's a strategist mm -hmm. or a consultant or whatever the hell he says. But that's, yeah. that, it, he yeah. turned it on its head. Jimmy Bulger was great at many things. He was particularly great at sophistry. Mm. I want to go back before we go too far ahead. There's something else that strikes me about the 50s, uh, going through all this uh, and the records. It was a time when families in Southie and elsewhere, big families, mm -hmm. could produce priests, mm -hmm. cops, jailers, criminals, and Absolutely. nuns. Not unusual in those That's communities. True. And, and mm -hmm. during the day, people would go off to work, and there would be one, literally one guy going off to the jail, maybe over Charlestown, or to the precinct house, and another guy would be going out to boost goods. Or well, look at Billy and, and, and Whitey. I mean, they came, is it envi that debate, is it environment? Or they came from the same household. And as Shelley said, Billy's view of his childhood was idyllic. Nobody got divorced in the projects. Nobody fought in the projects. And, and, and Whitey saw it completely different. And I think Whitey, one of the things that w was striking that when um, he was tested in prison, he had an IQ of 118, which is about what a college graduate, they said, would, would have. And this is a guy that didn't get through ninth grade. Um, and so they clearly had the same innate abilities. They came from the same household. They had the same parents. But you know, whereas, you know, it was obvious from what we found is that Whitey had a very different relationship with his parents, that his mother was a, a sunny person. I always saw the, the bright side of life. The, the cup was always half full. And the father was sort of a, who had lost his arm as a, as a, as, as, as a teenager, and you know, was kind of a morose figure. Married, married her late after having an earlier marriage. Big gap between the parents. And the father was so frustrated with Whitey. And Whitey talks about in his prison records of being beaten by him very regularly. And you know that's not in Billy sure. Bulger's memoir. So, not an unusual thing. Family has a troubled kid. Mm -hmm. Kid is what, twenty? Was he twenty-four when he becomes when he jumps Shelley from hanging on the backs of trucks and stealing goods Bank robber. to armed robbery? Yeah, it, it was 1955 when he was actually caught. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, he started, was hanging a lot, not a drinker. He was someone who always took care of his health, but was hanging out uh, at the bars and meeting people who, you know, other criminals and, and graduated to bank robbery. Um, and, and not just, um, I mean, it was a series of bank robberies around the country, so it, he, he was sort of expanding his horizons. And it's very interesting. You write about it in the book. He gets arrested, no surprise. He seemed to be surprised that he was arrested. Um, I always found it fascinating where he had gone on the road and the fact that far, long before uh, Teresa Stanley and, and Catherine yeah. Gregg, there was another that looked much like them who was on the road with him and went to the same places. Jackie. Yeah, San Francisco, Florida, you know, he, he yes, down south. Uh, in, and it, and it was pretty amazing that he came back for his girlfriend. I mean, he had fled, and 
had managed to elude authorities at a time in the 50s when they didn't have the, uh, the, the types of you know, electronic tracking that they have today. But, um, but yes, he, he went off with a girlfriend and, and came back because she wanted to return home. They, they get him in the box after they arrest him over in Revere. Mm -hmm. And he gives up some of the bank robbers that they don't know about. Yeah, well, that, that's a surprising part that we found in the, in the prison files. And, and I know you, you saw those same files. You broke the story. Thank you for yes, doing Yes, thank that. you. You broke it first. We, we were sitting on it for the book. We were crying when we were well, well, that's, that's what comes from being a daily reporter as opposed to an author. Um, but, but it was a fascinating to, to see that in, you know, when you look back to these old prison files, you see that when Whitey was caught, um, he realizes that um, he wants to save his girlfriend. So he tells authorities the identities of, of two of his accomplices in the bank robberies. It's the first evidence of him cooperating with law, with law enforcement. Um, but he's careful that there be no record of that. Um, he, he is sentenced to 20 years in prison, but the agreement is that she will be spared, and she was never charged, mm -hmm. even though she had been with him um, at the time of a couple of these robberies. So he's already caused, already caused the family a lot of heartache, but now he's going to prison. Mm -hmm. And the story gets interesting here because he has one leading advocate in the <laughs> family. And it is an interesting part of the book. Um, we call that chapter the University of Alcatraz because Whitey used prison as his, the school he never went to. But what's going on simultaneously is Billy Bulger, his younger brother, emerges as his advocate. He's the guy. And Billy was only a, a, a law student at the time. But the first thing he did was he went to the dean of Boston College Law School, a Jesuit priest named Bob Drynan, who you may recognize as a congressman later in life and the, the first guy that called for Richard Nixon to uh, be impeached. And, and Billy knew that, you know, when you're in prison, it looks pretty good if you're pen pals with a priest. But I think there was more than that. I think Billy really did, I think he really did believe that hooking Whitey up with a guy like Drynan would be good for, for, for his brother that his brother had gone down this wrong path. I think it was, I think it was a combination of it looks good if the, he's his pen pal, but it, it also would be good for Jimmy when he gets out. And so Drynan emerges as a very, um, it's funny because we let, went look at, I, I ran over to BC when I found out, Shelley got the records and said, this is parole advisor, is Bob Drynan. I go, you gotta be kidding me. So I run over to BC and go through the files, nothing. <laughs> Bob Drynan was no dummy. Uh, he, but there, I did find one letter, and the reason the letter was there, it would, unless you knew it, you wouldn't know it, because all it said is, Dear Father Drynan, and at the end it said, Jim. But it said, I'm sitting in Suffolk County Jail. That's Jimmy Bulger after he got sentenced. But Billy did more than that. Um, he enlisted the support of John McCormick, who um, the only reason the Bulgers even lived in South Boston was because of John McCormick. As a young and up-and-coming congressman, he signed on with the New Deal and was a worker for FDR. And of course, <laughs> there's got to be a quid pro quo. By the way, can you put that first housing project in New England in my district? Thank you very much. That's the only reason the Bulgers moved in there. And so John McCormick was then enlisted by Billy to also advocate for, for because they were very frustrated because he was so far away. He first got sent to Atlanta, and you know, Billy could only go down. It was very expensive. He's a law student, sure. doesn't have any money. So he's going down there maybe once a year. And so you have the Speaker of the House of Represent Re Representatives calling the director of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons say, can you go check on one of my constituents? And the guy jumps on a plane yes. and goes sees Whitey and Alcatraz. Pays he's a penny ant. He's a, a, a two-bit bank robber. And the head of the prisons is, how are things going, Jim? Well, this, Billy was this a is the most, It's just extraordinarily random, the fact that the majority leader of the House at that time uh, is John McCormick, and he'll become Speaker of the House. He's and then Billy's, Billy has graduated <laughs> from BC, but before he even starts law school, he has the dean of the law school mm -hmm. weighing in. Now, of course, Billy is the, the most educated in the family. And I mean, obviously, the family's upset. There's a lot of 
compassion and love for his brother. Absolutely. It's demonstrated here. And, and in fact, in the letters that you see that Whitey is writing home, he's writing that, you know, you know, how he intends to get out of prison and do well and how he's working hard and, you know, trying to follow all the rules and make sure he's, you know, can do everything possible to be released early. And the letters seem so sincere and, you know, friends that we interviewed that spent time with him in Alcatraz say that he would bemoan the fact that he was the black sheep of the family and he really intended to do well um, and, and is talking about after Billy's, you know, was first elected that he wanted to make his brother proud. So I think that he is, and he's writing to, you know, he was allowed to write to 10 people in prison and as Kevin said, you know, three of them were priests and, you know, he's, no, he's really, me. he's talking the talk that he needed to talk to get the support of the prison authorities. We're moving, we're moving along, we're in Alcatraz. It's extraordinary when you see the photos of Bulger in prison. It's just extraordinary because the first shot when he goes, when he goes to Atlanta, he looks mean, but he's scared. Mm, scared. No scared. Uh, and then you see the second shot. He's a little harder. Harder, older, but he's still not there. He comes out of Leavenworth. I'm sorry. He comes out of Alcatraz. He looks like an Aryan. He's Jack. He is. He is <laughs> calm. And you realize he was weightlifting. You every realize day. Yeah. he has pulled it together, and this is the scariest Bulger of all. Absolutely. He went to professional school at Alcatraz. Yeah, exactly. It was his grad school, and that, it's funny because when we looked, at, particularly the letters that Shelley got for the book, <clears throat> he talks about Alcatraz the way you and I might talk about our alma mater, and he's as fond yeah. of and he and his connections. He, you know, you and I oh, remember those keg parties back at UMass. That was awesome. <laughs> He talks about, oh, I remember we were in like cell block three. Or, it's funny because one of the, one of the uh, alleyways, one of the corridors in, in Alcatraz is called Broadway. I, I still have a hard time believing. I'm very skeptical of the idea that, that Whitey's participation in the LSD experiments and taking LSD created lifelong nightmares and psychological problems. I'm a product of the 60s. I knew a lot of people who were involved in less scientific drug experimentation. <laughs> but they sleep pretty well, and they don't kill a lot of people that but, I know yeah, of. You know, it's hard to say, but remember, he was injected with this stuff, which I think is a little different than taking a tab of LSD. The other thing is, I think it's pretty well documented. Yeah by friends and, and lovers that this was an issue in his life. He, he became a nocturnal animal. He could not sleep. He had nightmares. And you know, one of the things we have in the book is he actually went to see a psychiatrist about this, like a la Tony Soprano. So there's Whitey on the couch saying, my victims don't understand me. <laughs> um, so I mean, I think, I think it, but I think it's a combination because we took, Kevin Weeks was uh, one of, you know, one of Whitey's henchmen and Kevin cooperated with the book. He was very generous with his time with us. And he said that he saw it as kind of, Whitey wanted to get this on the record. Because he, he, Whitey always knew there would be a day of reckoning. And that he wanted this on the record that he was treated for this. So I think it's a combination. It's hard for us to say unless we had him here, and boy, I wish we had him here. But you know, um, what, 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 I find, what I find surprising is that, if I'm not mistaken, he got the benefit of only a day's time, or a day and a time. half, for each oh. acid trip. Yeah. Now, well, he initially he, he didn't, and, and actually, um, there's some evidence when he got to Alcatraz, he discovered that he had not been credited with all the time he should yeah. have been credited with for undergoing sure. these treatments, these LSD injections. And for the first time, you can see that Whitey is learning that he, he how to, you know, if you're reasonable and you, you're mm. sort of calculated, you can achieve what you want. And he writes a very polite letter to the prison authorities in Atlanta saying, you know, I believe I am owed more time. And, right. and, and he actually prevailed, and they mm. credited him with the time that he had not originally been given so that he could get out a little bit earlier. Long way from Southie to Alcatraz, mm -hmm. and yet he is there, he is there when John Kennedy becomes president. He's very proud. Southie is, Southie is wild. Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> Southie is wild, and he's celebrating in Alcatraz. Yes. Yeah. He was thrilled. It was, a, a tribe, it was a victory for the tribe. That's what would have been how he would see it. And Whitey's Irishness was important to him. So that was terrific. And 
but obviously things change. Things change. Kennedy's, Jack Kennedy's dead when he gets out. Was Southie, well, Southie was different in one way for sure, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden he gets out, 1965, and suddenly there is a circular firing squad of Irish gangsters in South Boston. Right. Timing is everything, though. I mean, uh, first of all, it's interesting that, you know, before Jack Kennedy died, he appointed as U.S. attorney in Boston uh, uh, a lawyer named Arthur Garrity. So why do you get Arthur out? Garrity, I should point out, was the advance man and one of the close campaign workers for John F. Kennedy right. during the presidential run. And so Whitey gets out, and timing is everything, because while he's in the can, the Irish, as they want to do, engage in a, a huge bout of fratricide. And the Irish, I mean, that's one of the weird things about Boston, by sheer numbers, didn't have numbers, the Irish should run the town. But they did not have the coalescing force of La Cosa Nostra that the Italians did to go around. So you had little factional groups. And you put Irish guys in the room, the first thing that happens is a split. You know? and, and so the Irish are killing each other. So Whitey comes out in 60. If he had been on the street, there's a good chance he would have been a victim or a perpetrator of that violence. In fact, he was a beneficiary of it. So he comes out. All these guys are dead or in the can. And he rises very quickly. And as Shelley said, if you read these letters, if you saw it, you would think this guy's going to, he's going to go straight. He wants to go straight to help, to, to, to get back in the, the graces of his family. And I think what happened, two things happened. First of all, he comes out and there's, he doesn't, he doesn't want to work. And he's like, I'm not getting up at 7 o'clock to do this crap. And, you know, he was working construction for a year. And the other thing, the opportunity was there because everybody was dead or in the can. So those two things, I think, combined that he, I don't, I, this work a day world, I don't need this baloney. So he comes out and he very quickly goes back into the gang life. And he's working for the Colleen's who run the rackets over there. A huge book. This was before the state became the biggest bookie in the state. Uh, there, was, there was a bookmaker in every bar in Southie. You, you, everybody knew who they were. They sat in the bar the whole day and you placed numbers. You, I thought you it did was the, legal. It was? I thought it was legal. When you were a kid? In Savin Hill, it might have been legal. But you know, but, but, but what's, what's, what's interesting, and we talk about the times having changed and the sort of the still, you know, the milieu of all this is that in the 50s, even in the 60s, a lot of people, no, no checkbooks, don't have check, checkbooks. Everything's cash. No credit cards. Banks don't give loans. Uh, they give loans for houses, but so if you're short of money, you need something, there's a guy in the corner. Yeah. And of course, it's so close to the New Deal and, well, the, what happened before the New Deal with the banks going down, bank robbers weren't the lowest, considered the least popular people in this society. So, so he gets out, Shelley. Oh, by the way, I, I, gotta, I gotta ask you. Uh, he's in, when, when he's still in, he gets a psychological report in Alcatraz that says he tends to be vain and to have vain attitudes about his personality, his character, and his intelligence. Right. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that, doesn't that strike you now how perceptive it is? I'm not an informant. Right. Uh, I don't strangle women. Uh, I don't do those sorts of things. Or father, as he wrote to, to uh, Drynan, um, the letter that wasn't delivered, father, I don't waste my time talking, uh, talking about women cars. and oh, right. cars, oh, yeah. cars as the other money. inmates oh, yeah. do, because oh, yeah. I know this is my chance to he shine. He, exactly. He was, he was going crazy at Atlanta being in an eight-man cell because it drove him crazy that all they talked about were women and cars and sex money. and money sex. and things like that, yes. So he rises. Much of the violence is over, but he's, he's rising in the ranks. And we, we're moving into the 70s. And Southie's changing at the right. same time. Right. You want to talk about that? Because you, in fact, you were more affected. Kevin, you weren't affected by, no, by, I was, by the ruling because you weren't, you my weren't family, here. My you were here then. From Southie, but I grew up yeah. in Malden. So tell us about what happens. Well, well I grew up right across the street in um, Savin Hills, the Savin Hills section of Dorchester. And at that time, our, prior to um, desegregation, our local high school was South Boston High School. And so I was a, about to be a senior in high school. I had spent three years at Southie High when the first year of busing. And I have to tell you, I mean, 
Um, I think that was generally a feeling. I certainly felt that it was so fundamentally unfair to me that if you dared to express any opposition to busing, you were immediately branded a racist. And that was so unfair because I felt as a you know, student getting ready to go into my senior year, I didn't want to go anywhere else. I didn't want to go to Wellesley, and I to, you know, and I, and I certainly didn't want to um, be any place other than that school. And so I think that um, it was unfair that everybody was branded racist if you didn't want to be part of that. Um, and so there was a real sense, I think, in South Boston and around the city that, um, that, that you know, um, that, w that it was unfair. And of course, Whitey took that to a whole new level. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't people who were opposed to busing who were race, weren't racist. Whitey of was course, racist. Of course there were. I mean, you Whitey see them, it's racist. what gave Southie such a bad name nationally. People, mm -hmm. you know, racial slurs and throwing rocks at buses of school kids. So I, I'm not certainly not suggesting there weren't people that were racist. Mm -hmm. But I do think there was a feeling that outsiders telling us what to do and what we should do and and you know, not understanding the legitimate argument against busing. And that was a Kennedy appointee, uh -huh. uh, a, Kennedy, a Kennedy appointee, an outsider, who came in. Right. He was most, one of the most despised people, probably the most despised person in the town. Um, no question. And two brothers become prominent opponents of busing in different ways, as they would, as they would work as they would lead parallel lives and often be involved in similar campaigns throughout life. So you have two people both involved. Well, Billy becomes the most outspoken, articulate opponent of busing, and uh, Whitey becomes the head of the military wing of that and decides that um, he will strike out. And that, um, you know, one of the things he did was, he was cute though, Whitey was really cute because he knew if he went anywhere near Garrity's house, they'd be on him like flies on, on flies. And so he went to, uh, Whitey went to a school about a half mile from Wells, um, Garrity's house in Wellesley and firebombed the school. And then called the fire department and said, if, you, if our kid's gonna be bust, your kid's gonna be bust. And in fact, those kids in Wellesley were bust for three months. And then Whitey, um, very pointedly, on the second, uh, when the second phase of busing started in 75, the day went off totally peacefully, mostly because folks in Southie kept the kids home. Um, but Whitey couldn't live with that. He wasn't living that. So we have the scene in which he goes down um, and, and, and tries to get guys to go with him. We talked to one guy. It was interesting because, you know, he said, I'm going to go, I'm go torch the uh, Kennedy homestead in Brookline. And some of the Irish guys he talked to down at the Mullins Club, the gang house, they go, oh, I don't want to do it. They liked the Kennedys. They didn't want to do it. As much as they were mad at Teddy Kennedy, because Teddy had emerged as the most vocal supporter politically of Judge Garrity and desegregation and busing. So there was a lot of animosity directed at Teddy. That they, the, the people that were celebrating Jack's election in 1960, 15 years later, would see the Kennedys as the epitome of you know, do as I say, not as I do. They're sending their kids to private schools. They don't have to go through this stuff. So, but Whitey had trouble getting, like, these Irish-American gangsters to get in the car with them to go do it. But one guy did get in the car with them. And they drive over to Beale Street in um, Brookline. And first, Whitey took out a, a spray paint, a paint can and sprayed paints out in front of the house, bus Teddy. And then he takes a Molotov cocktail and he goes to the back and throws it through the door and causes quite a bit of damage. I think, I think the, the, the house was closed for maybe three months or so. There was a lot of, re I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's the only homestead of a, a U.S. president that was firebombed by a gangster. And then his third act, which, um, it's funny because Pat Nee, uh, who was an associate, a rival, so he actually told us the whole story that, um, Whitey t and Pat went over, he says, I'm gonna go shoot up the Globe, and Pat's going, let's go. Uh, because the Globe was so despised for its support of busing um, in South Boston. I mean, there had been just ordinary people were blocking in the trucks. I saw it with my own eyes, because I would go to my Aunt Mary's house on East Second Street every Sunday. My mother and her told the same stories every Sunday. I had to listen to them. But anyway, they, you could see it, that people would, when there was a, a Globe truck pulling up on Broadway, people would pull and like surround it so it couldn't move. 
and Whitey decided they would shoot up the globe. So he stops on right out here on Morrissey Boulevard and shoots up and 12 um, gauge shotgun. 12 gauge shotgun. Boom, 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 boom. And he nearly hit a um, a young security guy named John McAuliffe, who was 18 years old and shared the same name as uh, Whitey's old girlfriend, Jackie McAuliffe, but no relation. And then, so the security, you know, they go crazy, they drive away, and so the, the next day there's cops lined out in front of the Globe. And so Whitey goes up on the expressway and fires at the Globe from that side. And he was resourceful. But the funny thing, in, in the letters we yeah, got, he was very proud of the that. letters that uh, Shelley obtained for the book, Whitey t talks at great length about he's so proud of shooting up the globe. And he des describes it in the context of that they had to like put all millions of dollars into security. They had to put all this bulletproof glass and they had to hire all these new security guards, guys that are now retired with good pensions because of me. He said he was a job creator. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Bulger, <laughs> job creator. And what's so interesting, because some of these actions strike me as juvenile delinquency, Big the spray God. paint, you know, the spray yeah, paint, yeah, and yeah, even yeah. even the even even the tossing of the of of the Molotov cocktail. He's not doing it with the big ga the gang that he now controls. He makes a phone call to Wellesley, which I thought was interesting. I'm going to burn every school down <laughs> if it takes me 30 years. Right. Another thing, sort of again, sort of like, like a, a burst a, yeah. a burst of anger, all juvenile delinquency, and yet. These acts were occurring at the same time when he's killing people at the fastest rate he'll ever clip. Absolutely. Sons of Southie. Absolutely. The, the, one, one, one of the scenes we have in the book is that, you know, when he makes the deal with John Conley, they're sitting in the car down in Wollaston, and he says, I'm no informant. That's, he starts going with the, the sophistry crap that I'm this, I'm that, but I'm not an informant. And then with, within a month of that, he, he had always wanted to kill this guy named Tommy King who was a Mullins guy who he didn't trust, and he, he always thought that the Mullins guys, who they, he kind of, when the, when the gang war ended and Howie Winter decided that Whitey would be, the, he would control Southie he, and became a member of the Winter Hill Gang, the Mullins guys were like, wait a minute, we were winning the gang war, and now we're like, we have to answer this guy. So Whitey very consciously wanted to take out on the Mullins guys. But it's very interesting that within a, a month of being made in a, you know, an informant for the FBI, he sets out to kill Tommy King. And when he kills Tommy, he buries his body secretly down near the, uh, the, train, state, the train track that runs from Quincy over to, to Neponset. And then he kills a guy named Buddy Leonard, who was another Mullins guy and same friendly day. with Tommy, same day. And then he goes and sits with his, his uh, handler, John Conley, and he tells him a story. Tommy King killed Buddy Leonard. And Conley writes this down and disseminates it to the Boston Police Department. The state, everybody gets this. So the cops are out there looking for Tommy King. And uh, unless they were digging in the sand down by the bridge, they wouldn't find him. But then that's not enough. Then Whitey goes back and says, oh, um, the Mullins are going to kill Tommy King because he killed Buddy Leonard. And then the third, some weeks pass, and he sits down with Conley again. He says, they took Tommy King out. He's dead. And you'll never find his body because they buried it. I remember they, so Tommy King was found buried on the other side of the Neponset River at the base of the, uh, the train. The, the train. And um, there were some people that had followed him during the 80s. And they, had, they got a bug in the car for a while. And the one thing they could never understand was what they were talking about and laughing about. Say hi to Tommy. And so finally, finally in the year 2000, they figured out what it meant when, when Bulger would say to Martirano and whoever else was in the car, tip your hat, tip your hat, fellas, tip your hat to Tommy. Because they were driving Passing over the, the bridge and they were referring to the fact that he was buried below and they thought nobody would find nice him. Nice guys. Um, so now you have, so you have, you have Bulger turning, Southie is turning, Bulger is turning against the Kennedys, against the people who brought Arthur Garrity into the neighborhood. And even Dryden, it strikes me that even, it's, they, they, he turns even against Dryden. Can you talk about that? Well, you, you interviewed him. I did, well, I talked to Bob Dryden's uh, sister, Helen, who was 
the longtime secretary uh, at Boston College Law School. She said that Bob would very frequently bring it up at their Sunday dinners in Chestnut Hill, how frustrated he said. He spent so much time, he invested so much time in Bulger because he went right back into the, into the, uh, you know, the life of crime. But, you know, th this is like more, you can't make it up. The reason that busing even happened is because Bob Drynan was more or less the author of this important report that led to the um, Racial Imbalance Act here in Massachusetts. He more or less you know, skirted out the law. He, he drew what was gonna be the law. And that was the law that the Boston School Committee um, ignored for 10 years. And they just let it go, and they let it go, and they, they wouldn't address it. The schools were completely segregated, and they wouldn't do anything about it, even though you know, Bob Drynan's report pointed this out. And so busing, very, you know, Garrity Im imposed busing largely because of what Bob Drynan wrote in 1965, the same year that Whitey gets out of the can because Bob Drynan is his parole advisor. You can't make this stuff up, but we did. Shelly, I, Shelley, I think, you wrote, I think you wrote that, that it, was wide, it was a widespread rumor in Southwick that in fact Whitey had firebombed a school, in, well, I think it was the school, or, or, or maybe, the birth, maybe the birthplace, but I think it was the school, that people talked about this openly. Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for Whitey trying to cultivate, cultivate that reputation as sort of the neighborhood avenger, that idea that, you know, he may be a gangster, but he's our gangster. I mean, I'm sure there are people in, in Southie who, I mean, they, the, the Globe was despised at that time. There was this, you know, anger about busing. So, um, Whitey, you know, I don't, I'm not saying people would have condoned firebombing JFK's birthplace. Yeah. I don't think that I know was some well people known. Who but, would. But, 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 I, but I think that, you know, certainly there were people cheering that he was shooting up the globe, and they were very proud of that. And, and as I said, even now, as he sits in Plymouth jail, he's writing letters about what a great day it was. <laughs> so, you, you, one, would, one would figure that if something is sweeping the town, if rumors are sweeping the town, that some people who are in the business of knowing what the town is thinking and what the rumors are include politicians, and there's his brother. And we see this, you and I were at the Government Reform Committee hearing when he testified under immunity in what, 2003. Three, yeah. And there seemed to be a, a parallel here, because I remember 2003 in which he professed not, uh, Bill professed not to know that his next door neighbor was Win Winter Hill. He professed not to know what Winter Hill was. Right. Uh, that he didn't know what his brother did. 1986, President Reagan's Organized Crime Commission comes out with a report saying that Whitey Bulger is a reputed killer, drug dealer, all Bank around Robert. criminal. The only thing objected Senate to is that they called know him about a it. He was Senate, really upset that they called him a drug dealer. A drug dealer. He but didn't this, oppose but, the bank robber, the this, killer part. But somehow there is this, this disconnect as if, didn't that, did that strike you? you? I mean, this has happened before with, a, with behavior during the political campaigns uh, that Bill Bulger ran. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that um, if you look at, um, you know, that Whitey was very careful to um, put out this, you know, this promote this idea that, that he had nothing to do with drugs, that he kept the drugs out of the town. Um, and there were the old stories going back, you know, to the days when he was being touted as this sort of Robin Hood figure. And of course, John Conley, his handler, is, is telling people oh, he would never do drugs. Oh, no, 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 he's, he's not into that at all. And, and, and you recall there was even some testimony um, at one point by Kevin Weeks saying that Conley went to see Billy after Whitey was first indicted and said, oh, no, 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 he, no, he would never be involved in that sort of thing. So I think that they were very careful to sort of cultivate this reputation within the community that right. he's really not such a bad guy. And what we found, of course, is that, I mean, over the years, it's, he, he's been charged with shaking down drug dealers and taking, wow. you couldn't sell drugs in Southie without paying a cut to Whitey, but we actually found there was an instance where he, he traveled to the projects in South Boston with a cocaine, of, uh, a kilo of cocaine oh. in, the, in the car, a 
according mm. to Steve Fleming, he said he was very upset. What are you doing? And it was at a time when the DEA and the Boston police were trailing them, and he was really nervous, and but that Whitey felt uh, just that in invincible in South Boston. Ow. Right back. That's my buddy going. <laughs> <laughs> hey. So, so we have we 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 go on. Ted Kennedy, See, Ted Kennedy. Like in fact, if I'm not mistaken, water. Kennedy was accosted the same day that Ted Landsmark was speared with a flag, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't recall that. You might know that better than but I the, do. But the, but the town changes toward, toward Ted Kennedy, the Kennedy's general, oh, oh, and to Democrats. No, abs absolutely. That's abs absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, th there was such vehement opposition to, to busing, and, and, and Ted was you know, the, the biggest you know, supporter of that. And so, yes, there was a lot of anger. I mean, and, and the, thus the attack on the, on the JFK birth, birthplace. Ted Kennedy, though, uh, was there thick and thin for, for Bill Bulger, wasn't he? Well, he was one of the, he was when, yes, I mean, when um, Mitt Romney was calling on, on Billy to step down as president of the University of Massachusetts, it, it was Ted who supported him. I don't think Ted knew the story about the, uh, the Molotov cocktail on Bill Street. <laughs> Might have been different. <laughs> I apologize. I had to go see a man about a horse. <laughs> um, so Ted, Ted, Ted was magnanimous, and yet it's it's funny because I remember I was asking Shelley. I think it was the uh, uh, Ted was accosted by the crowd the same time, the same day that Ted Landsmark got speared. I think yeah. he was walking through that area. A lot different than 1969. I remember the story. I know the cop of, who saved Teddy that day. Uh, Walter Fahey who was probably one of the greatest street cops in Boston, yeah. and he opposed busing, but he actually rescued Teddy that day and kind of moved him into the JFK building. And it was a big, it was a dramatic change a within a few years, from 19, it was 19, 1969, 1969, or it was actually it was 70. It was after the accident down at Chappaquiddick. Ted came through South Boston. He was kind of coming out again in public, got a huge hand, huge applause along the way. I remember Marty Nolan. Marty Nolan told me he came over. Marty, he, he, Marty Nolan, Globe reporter, he said, he said uh, Ted came over through the crowd as he was getting cheered along the way, and Ted came over and said, ah, they love you when you're down. <laughs> it's such an it's, Irish thing. They love you when you're down. Um, <laughs> so it is, we go back to that, we go back to the Alcatraz analysis. Very high opinion of his principles. So he's fighting for Southie. He's fighting on, against busing. Uh, he's, he's killing the sons of Southie. He's, he's probably kids, commits most of his murders in that cluster of years. Mm -hmm. And he's also, as you've noted, he's, he's uh, charging, tr charging fees to traffic dealers. And this is all at the same time, drug dealers, it's the same time when the rate of suicides in Southie is escalating, people jumping on roofs. Mm -hmm. It is hard to reconcile. Yeah, and um, like, as we try to show that Whitey, Whitey's in whole life, there was an arc of myth making. So when he was a, you know, a young uh, tailgater and then a bank robber, he was you know, taking Mrs. Mokley home from the groceries and all that stuff. And then, you know, as he's emerging as this, you know, obviously dominant criminal, he's spreading the stuff that, you know, that they're kicking the drug dealers out of Southie. And, you know, there are a lot of people that would have been on the payroll, uh, a legitimate payroll, because Bill Bulger got them jobs, and they all believed. I heard people say that when I lived here in the 80s and the 90s, over there, I'd hear people at Amrines, the Cornerstone, at the McKeon Post, when I went to the Veterans Post, people said this. Jimmy Bulger keeps the drugs out of South and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I'd see people doing lines on the bars in West Broadway. It was, there was more cocaine here uh, you know, per capita than I think any neighborhood in the city. It was all over the place. And so there was that sort of the myth-making on, going on there, and there were people that propagated that myth. But you and I, as you cited that, I mean, there were, there were hardly any families over there that weren't touched by drugs and didn't have kids that were involved in the life. And it's, uh, 
I found that, personally, I found that when I was a young reporter, at the, first at the Herald and then at the Globe, I found it insulting when people would suggest that to me, that, you know, Jimmy Bulger kept the drugs out of Southie because I lived there and I knew it was not true and I knew so many people that had trouble with drugs. We're going to open the floor to questions in about four or five minutes. And bef before we do that, I think we'll probably get a lot of questions, I'm guessing, about current events. Uh, before we do that, and to close this segment, let's talk about the consequences. We've reported, we've all reported about the 19 murders, horrible murders, families devastated. Talk about the consequences of this war on organized crime launched by Bobby Kennedy with zeal in pursuit of enemies, and what some of those consequences were uh, to Southie, to the city, to the state. Because well, I mean, at one it, level, the war worked. La Cosa Nocia, these guys, you look around, all they get is sports book left. But I mean, you could also argue that the Massachusetts lottery did as much as anybody to put these guys out of business, because the number was their bread and butter, and they lost the number. But I mean, there were, you know, there were obvious consequences. I, I would say the biggest consequences, if you look at this, is that the nation's premier law enforcement agency was totally corrupted. And it wasn't a bad agent and a bad supervisor. If you see in our book, we got guys in Washington, in headquarters, reading reports that Whitey and Stevie Flemmy are implicated in four murders in a 15-month period. And they're not saying, close them out. We can't deal with these guys. They're describing them as assets. So I think the biggest consequence is if you look at, and the one thing I don't like, when Bob Mueller, the FBI director, you know, dismissively suggests this is ancient history, I don't accept that. I don't accept that it's ancient history because as recently as last year, we reported about them using a guy named Mark Rossetti who's implicated in a number of murders and they didn't have a problem with it. So I think that's the biggest consequence, the idea that our, and, and this is the other thing we, Shelley and I really felt strongly, there have been, many books written about Whitey Bulger, probably too many, but none of those books really paid anything but lip service to the victims. And you know what? The victims who are, are to us are not names. We know these people. We've seen them. We've talked to them. We've been in their houses. And they have been treated so shabbily by, it's fine, you can talk about the FBI did this, but since the FBI corruption was exposed, our Justice Department has treated these people like dirt. And they have wasted our taxpayer money by not settling with these families and carrying on these, these, these fiascos downtown in courthouses, flying guys up from the Justice Department, and, and they, are, they embarrass me, and they disrespect these people. And that, to me, is the other part of this story that the corruption continued. It was a different form of corruption. The Justice Department ignored this stuff when Whitey was killing people, and then after it's exposed, instead of doing the right thing, as Tommy Donahue, whose father was murdered on the waterfront in 1982, said to me, you know, everybody thinks all we care about is the money. But he goes, what I would really like is for my government to apologize to my mother. And I don't think Tommy Donahue is asking too much. Did you talk to Patricia Dunning? Did you talk to Pat Dunning? Did you talk to Patricia Dunning? Yes. yes. It was, that was a very, very touching part of the book. And I just want to just, just quickly talk about her and, and, and her story. Uh, because I just thought that that gave, just that gave a heartbeat to the, the pain and the agony. Well, yeah, I think part of the problem with the Whitey story over the years is that people do romanticize him. I mean, that you see these, you know, Hollywood, like the departed, trying to make him to be like, you know, this um, romantic figure, when in fact, th there, is, there, there are so many people that were devastated by this. And the Dawn of Hugh family, I mean, that is one of the saddest stories. I mean, she, um, you know, she's home cooking dinner, waiting, you know, on the phone with him, I'm coming, I'm coming, she's waiting for him to come home. And they have these three young boys, and she sees the car on the news. That's how she finds out that he's dead. She's watching the news and sees the, the bullet-riddled car and knows that you know he's been hurt and is calling frantically, calling hospitals. It takes a long time before she even gets a call from anybody telling her that he's in the hospital. And when she finally goes, she finds out that, he, that he's, he's dead. But 
um, for years. I mean, the way she was treated, they actually, FBI agents actually asked, accused her of having an affair, that maybe okay. she had an affair, and that was why her husband was killed. Yep. And, and they actually, you know, they, there was a trial, as you know, um, a, a Jimmy Flynn, who resembled, Whitey apparently, allegedly, was wearing a mustache, that, and he looked like a fake mustache, and looked like Jimmy Flynn. Jimmy is acquitted of the murder, and Pat just thinks, well, you know, Murder's she still anyway. thinks maybe he did it. So it takes years, and when they finally file a suit against the government, the case is dismissed. Not because they didn't have a case. Well, actually, they, they go to trial. They, they at first, they, they prevail. They get a judgment, and then the appeals court dismisses it. It's taken away from them. You know, they, they finally get their day in, 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 in court, yeah. And, and it's taken away, and, the, and the, judge, the judges rule that, the appeals court rules in a split decision that, um, yeah, you know, you, you should have known sooner that the FBI was corrupt. corrupt. You yeah, waited too late to file your suit. Sorry. Yeah. And, and the one judge who, um, you know, the dissent, judge dissenting, Terrell. yeah, he says, it was actually more than one judge that dissented, um, but um, Torello wrote this amazing opinion where he called it official uncontrolled wickedness. Yeah. Yeah. There's two images that strike me so much. And, when John Conley, the, talk about ruined lives, John Conley, an FBI agent who, you know, obviously engaged in corruption, took money from these guys, helped them get people killed. But as we say in the book, John Conley did exactly what the FBI expected of him. He learned at the foot of Paul Rico. And you do play God when you're an FBI agent. You do decide who dies, who lives. And he did it, and now <clears throat> he's convicted of racketeering. You were there when that happened. John drives home to Linfield that night and explains to his sons, he sits his three sons on the couch, and he said it was the hardest thing he ever had to do. He told Shelley this when Shelley interviewed him. I had to tell my sons I was going to jail. <clears throat> and it's a very moving moment. When I, and I remember reading the, the interview when Shelley gave it to me, and I read it. But you know, my next thought was, Pat Dunahue did the same thing. She took Michael, who was 13, Sean, who was 11, Tommy, who was eight, eight years old, and put them on the, the couch and said, Dad died. And before she got the words out, Tommy started crying. So those are the two images I would and, leave you with. And the reason Donahue died, according to the government, <clears throat> is because John Conley had betrayed the identity of the informant, Halloran, to Whitey and Stevie. Ladies and gentlemen, now you Question. understand what, that, that sagas are told all night long in front of campfires. Uh, we don't have any time to continue this, so let's have questions from the floor for the next half hour. Yes, there are microphones. They're right in both uh, aisles. This, the, both aisles have microphones. Could you come over and... Thank you. Right there, in the middle of the aisle. Thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, Whitey Bulger's relationship with Howie Winter? Well, Howie, I mean, we talked to Howie for the book. And Howie, I mean, the let's funny go, thing about let's, Howie. Let's, 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 Go back. We have a tendency, of course, to, to, to assume that everybody understands oh, the, all the names on the roster. Howie Winter yeah. was the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, which was not named for him. It's named for that section of Somerville. And, you know, when Whitey, Whitey sued for peace, when the Mullins had the upper hand in the gang war in Southie, and he was, he was ingenious. He made the move. He went to Howie and said, you need to mediate this. And Howie told us he was very impressed by Jimmy in the sense that, you know, he, he, knew, he carried himself, he was charismatic, he had done that. Now, a guy like Howie would have been very impressed that he did time in Alcatraz. He would have, if you're in that life, that's very impressive. That's like, oh, you're reading a resume. Oh, you went to Har I mean, Harvard. Oh, you went to Alcatraz. That's very impressive. So, um, and, and so Howie decided this, and, and the funny thing is that culturally and socially, Howie was more comfortable with the Mullins guys. They'd sit around the bar and drink, and Whitey wasn't that kind of guy. He wasn't a drinker. But what, how he looked at Whitey and said, this guy's gonna make me money. 
And the Mullins guys were a little undisciplined. They were kind of, these guys, the Mullins guys, those are, they all were fighting in uh, the Viet Cong in the jungles. They weren't going to take crap from anybody over there. But how he recognized and made him to, you know, his great regret to this day, because how he ended up going into, the, into prison on a race fixing case in which Stevie and Whitey were removed from the case because they were informants. And they were allowed to, they're, they're, not only did, the, you know, it's all fine and good that they got rid of their competition in the mafia, but they got rid of their, comp, their, their, their friends. Their friends went to prison and they, they you know, blossomed because of it. You know, I, uh, White, I do want to say, though, that yeah. Howie Winter um, said that he did think that Whitey was a little off because he, he recounts a couple of stories. One is that they were in the garage they all hung out at Somerville. in Somerville. And these women used to come, and they were kind of like wise guy groupies, and they would bring dinner to the wise guys. And one day he came into the garage, and this woman is tied to a chair, and Whitey's throwing knives, like a circus act, you know, by her head. And, uh, the, and he's like, geez, something's wrong with him. And, and he said another time they were, it was the bicentennial, and they were at a, a club down near, um, near Faneuil Hall, and he said Whitey thought it was funny to take this woman by her ankles and hang her over the ledge of the rooftop. I do that all the time. Yeah, it was one of this those is, things. It's you know, the same, kind of the same person that stops the car to yeah. have the little old so. lady across the street. <laughs> I, I read your book, and I read Dick Lehrer's biography of Whitey, and I noticed there were a few little discrepancies, one of which was the uh, story of how Whitey's father lost his arm. And if I recall correctly, you cited your source as Billy Bulger's book. I'm wondering, how reliable a source do you consider Billy Bulger? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's his family. But yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say to that. Well, it's, 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 it's interesting because we have, you were talking before about myth, mythology and, and myth making. Uh, yeah, and his family, that would have been the myth that the poor, hardworking father lost the arm when he was, you know, working in a real gar yard. It turns out the poor, hardworking father lost it when he was much younger, just goofing around. Yeah. Mm. And yet families, Sometimes families need certain, what, polite lies to get by, yeah. uh, perhaps. Not this mine, one, though. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think all but this families, one, but all this families one, have But this, this one was used often. The story, the description of the father was used often. But I mean, you know, wh however he lost the arm is one thing, but the fact that he lost the arm really impacted the family sure. because he couldn't right. be an earner. There wasn't... Yeah. You know, there weren't services for, for the disabled then. There wasn't anything. It's how they ended up in South Boston, really. Yeah, it's because they were poor and the father had difficulty supporting yeah. them that they qualified to live in the project. Sir. So I have a couple questions. One was stepping back in time with the uh, Brinks robbery down in Plymouth with Whitey. And then with the Bennett brothers, uh, what the connection was with Whitey going off to jail and coming back and then retaliation and where did the Bennett brothers fit into the... He, he really had nothing to do with them. The Stevie was connected with the, the Bennett brothers. In fact, Stevie was charged, Stevie with, those charged with those murders. Charged with those murders. Whitey, I don't even know if Whitey knew them. Uh, but he would have been in the can before they started getting killed. This is, why I find, this is why I find the story and the era so fascinating because all the neighborhoods had, had their own their yeah. own guys that right. uh, Roxbury. were charged of gambling, yes. yeah, loan it was really, sharking. It, it was the Bennett's and that the brought Bennett's Stevie were... into the fold, and that's where he got his start, definitely. I know why he served time with um, one of the guys that was involved in the Plymouth robbery, I believe. Right. Okay, great. But, you know, it, it, i got to ask you this question. I mean, it, it, it is. You, you mentioned before about the mafia. We're talking about the mafia. And it was, it was interesting that, that Whitey and Stevie... Uh, got work because, contract killings, because the mafia was short on they were killers. Well, they and they found Jerry and Julo complaining, I can't get anybody to kill for and me. So, These guys so are they useless. Turned, My so, guys are useless. So they, they found plenty of people, they, they found plenty of people, plenty of Irish Americans willing to do the job. And so, you know, the whole story, it's like the Italian Americans like me, we, we keep on wondering why they kept on going after the vowel people. Well, yeah, that well, comes that back to you, that comes back to what you said about the war and organized crime and the fact that it, it was a national strategy that really didn't take into account regional differences and they didn't consider the FBI wasn't considering that at some point the Irish were really, you know, just as dangerous, if not more so, than the mafia in Boston. Um, but they didn't they didn't go down that road. It, at some point, obviously, protected them. 
Sir. Harvey. Is, is he next? Uh, no, I think you're, you're next. Uh, you, the three of you uh, have studied the FBI as long and as closely as anybody yeah, in but town. We haven't sued them like you, Harvey. Yeah, Harvey. <laughs> uh, that hasn't gotten me anywhere either. <laughs> Uh, Ladies and, and general, gentlemen, Harvey Silverglade. Yeah. Uh, my my civil pick libertarian attorney general. Attorney, go ahead. And so my question is this. How do you explain, or can you explain, how it is that for all the time you've been studying the FBI and the time I've been dealing with them, the culture of the organization hasn't seemed to change at all. Attorneys, doesn't matter, we've had some pretty good attorneys general, some bad ones. Attorney, no attorney general has changed its culture. No director of the FBI has changed its culture. How can this be? I'm reminded of the movie Grand Hotel, you know, the, the directors go and the attorneys general go and they come, but the Grand Hotel goes on forever. Can you explain the resistance of the FBI to change? Uh, Howie, uh, Harvey, like all good lawyers, you know the answer to your question before you ask it. <laughs> but I'm over that, here and you're over there. I know, there. I know, I know. I, like I said, this is, I, I've argued this for many years. The idea that the FBI learned its lesson from the Bulger debacle is baloney. And all I would say is look at the Mark Rossetti case. You know, it, it, it's, it's a mini Bulger. That's what the Stadies call them. They call them mini Bulger. So, I mean, and the reason look at the way the, the Justice Department spun this from the very beginning. It was a rogue agent and his rogue supervisor. No, it wasn't. And, it, it, and like, John Conley did nothing that Paul Rico didn't do. So the, it was right through the organization. And so when the Justice Department, in my opinion, the idea that John Conley is the only agent that is in prison for the behavior that the FBI engaged with, with Whitey Bulger is a farce. It's an outrage. And when John Durham, the special prosecutor, finished the prosecution of John Conley in 2002, he promised that he would release a report. There would be a report. And I believe Mike Sullivan, the US attorney, echoed it and said, we will release a report and we will identify the agents that did all this stuff. It, I'm, I'm glad I didn't hold my breath waiting for that report I, I had, because I would be long dead. I have that on tape. It was 2000. It was, he said he'd have it in three months. <laughs> I asked him three months later where it was. He smiled at me. Two years later when Connolly was convicted, they had a press conference afterwards. I asked him where the, where the report was. Smile. Uh, they wasted millions of dollars sure. and we kept on wondering where the report was. It was never turned in. There isn't that report. One of the most striking things we have in the book, and it's, we don't go into, it's not a huge, but it's there. And there's a report in which Steve Flemmy gave a debriefing to the DEA and state police, and he alleged that an FBI agent took 40 pounds of C4 explosives and gave it to Whitey. And Stevie says that Whitey then gave it to the Irish Republican Army. Now that's kind of a bombshell, no pun intended. So Shelley calls the agent and said, what do you have on this? What do you say to this? He goes, I never did that. And then Shelley's second question was, well, what, did you, what did the authority, when you were questioned about this by the FBI or the judge, what did they say? Nobody ever questioned me. The, what, do you want to? Well, part of the problem is we don't really know because <laughs> the, so many reports are still under seal. I mean, the, you know, not only this report that gave some full accounting of what their findings were just in this case, but there are thousands of documents that are under seal, and there's no reason for that. I mean, there's, you know, we have findings by judges in the civil cases that the FBI as an institution was liable and that they stuck their heads in the sand and that they, you know, that they deliberately looked the other way in, in, in cases and, and, and sabotaged efforts of other law enforcement agencies to, to go after Whitey. So, um, there's still too many things you that know, are on the seal. I would like to see Bill Bratton become the next FBI director, not because he's a Dorchester guy, because I think he would address that culture. We actually thought that when Robert Mueller, who to. was, Robert Mueller was an acting U.S. attorney here in Boston, he was here during the 80s, uh, had a good reputation. I actually thought that when he became the head of the FBI, we were going to have some turnover and, and, and reform in that organization. By way of an answer, Harvey, um, it's interesting. 
there were two competing organizations in the 1950s. One that believed in organized, that it was organized crime was there and one that didn't. The one that didn't was the FBI. The one that did was the FBN, the Federal Bureau Narcotics. of Narcotics. It was a predecessor of the DEA. Bobby Kennedy in the mid-1950s loved traveling with these guys. He went out at night with them, uh, made arrests with them, and there were reports that he loved beating up suspects with them. <laughs> Uh, he was fighting the enemy within, perhaps with too much zeal, which is another lesson here. J. Edgar Hoover, who was a Methodist, wanted agents who were Jesuit trained. And if you look at the number of FBI agents, you'll find extraordinary numbers from Holy Cross, BC. from BC, from um, Georgetown, Georgetown uh, from smaller colleges, and the, the Jesuits, Jesuits who I love, you find both ends of Jesuits, but what's the virtue of the order? Obedience. And Hoover had an organization that was all about public relations. He was the first public relations expert. Uh, that's why we have the, the, the most wanted program, you know, the, the America's most wanted. Uh, it was driven by largely by public relations. But Bob Mueller is Princeton, and he hasn't seemed to have changed anything. Yeah, and that's the institutional. You know, sometimes people people go back to the movie, The Invasion of Body Snatchers. You know, remember, they still I leave actually, pods behind them, and they become the next. When Bob generation was U.S. attorney, I actually sat down with him for an interview, and I asked him, could he tell me anything about Bulger? He said, No. I said, Were you aware that this was after we reported he was an informant? He said, were you aware he was an informant? And he said, off the record? I go, all right, no comment. <laughs> On the day Bulger was arrested, he flew in, and the FBI jet flew in under the radar, no, and he went to the office. They had uh, tea or coffee and, and, and cake with the agents, and he flew back out under the public radar. I remember, I think it was, I think it was, uh, John McIntyre, one of the murder victims, his brother was there. And, yes. and he, he talked about the fact that, you know, uh, he, he said to me, uh, Steve Fleming is a monster. He killed my brother. But that monster got up and said, I'm sorry, in a courtroom. I haven't heard that from Bob Mueller. I haven't heard wow. that from the U.S. attorney. Well, you know, I actually had an experience with Mueller that, um, resonates now that I hear you talking. I went down about 20 years ago. I represented, still do, Jeffrey McDonald in the Fatal Vision right. murder case. And I had uncovered a tremendous amount of real corruption in the prosecution of McDonald. I, Mueller was head of the criminal division at Maine Justice. And you know we knew each other from Boston. So he, I asked for an audience with him. He said, sure, come on down. I walk into this huge conference room. And he's got FBI agents lined up on one side. And he's got people from Maine Justice lined up in the other. I walk into the room, and the first, he looks at me and says, welcome, Harvey. One thing before we start, criticism of the Bureau is a non-starter. <laughs> Why did I bother flying down the shuttle? Yeah. Criticism of the Bureau, so that's what we're dealing with. It's not a but lot I, but I think in fairness, we also have to point out that there's, there's equal trouble in the Justice Department itself amongst in this case, there are a number of people to point out as well, federal prosecutors uh, who were involved as well, not just the FBI. The question is, you mentioned talking to Kevin Weeks. When you talk to someone like him, so many awful things, he's got an agenda. Uh, how do you determine whether what he tells you is uh, credible? Well, the thing about Kevin Weeks is he's testified under oath, you know, at a, at a number of trials. and. Um, you know, and, and, and jurors have found him credible. And, and so, I mean, we, we quote, you know, his story has been pretty consistent. And he spent five years in jail for, in prison for being an accessory on five murders. And his deal is that if he gets caught in a lie, his deal is null and void. Now, you know, Whitey's been writing for pris from prison, you know, from jail, from the Plymouth jail, to a friend that there are two things that he most wants to refute when he takes the stand at his upcoming trial. One, I was never an FBI informant. Uh, and two, that he did not kill the women. Two of the 19 victims are women, and he's very adamant that he did not kill those women. And you know, one of the murders, Deborah Davis, it's Whitey's word against Steve Fleming. And, um, 
It's awesome. That's it. Uh, the, the, one of the other murders, Deborah Hussey, it is um, Kevin Weeks and Steve Flemmy who both say they witnessed, you know, Whitey kill her. So um, it's really for a jury to decide. But you know, you have a jury. We put that right well, in the prologue. Jurors, though. We said yeah. these guys are criminals. You, you know, but in, you, but you in can addition judge to them. It's for what you to decide. Are. As you read the book, what do you believe? You, but you in know, addition to the jury, a lot of people. In, the, in addition to the jury, the bones say he was telling the truth because he told them where they would find the bodies. They found the bodies. Right. So that corroborated his story quite a bit. You know, there's another thing, too. Like, I mean, it, that's always the key. When, when um, at, at these criminal trials, you know, the, the lawyers will get up and say, you can't believe. They said it at John Conley's trial in Miami. They said it in, in Boston. You can't believe these criminals. They're, they're all liars. It's like, well, yeah, those are the guys you picked to be FBI informants, right? They were okay when you used them to make cases yeah. against people. Um, but they say, oh, they're liars. You can't believe anything. But interestingly, w one thing that I found the most convincing was um, John Moderano. He's pled guilty to killing 20 people, served 12 years in prison, is a free man because he's testified against, you know, Conley and others. Um, he came forward and said, we killed Richard Castucci in 1976, a, a, a nightclub owner from Revere because we found out that he was an FBI informant. Now, when he came forward with this story in 98, 1998, everybody's looking, the prosecutors didn't know that. Nobody knew that he was an FBI informant from that time frame. And they went back and dug through really old files, and there it was. It, had, it was not something that was out on the street that people knew. How would John Moderano know that he was an FBI informant unless, as he said, he was told, they were told, by an FBI agent. So you just have to put the pieces together and that's, that will be for people to decide as the case goes to trial. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'd like to hear your opinion as to what you feel the diligence or the sincerity was of the FBI in their search for a bulger after he, he fled. The, f <laughs> the first two years, they didn't find him because they weren't looking for him. And as we detail in the book, that was a farce. They assigned the initial search for Whitey Bulger to the very organized crime squad that was corrupted by him. So the idea that they were looking for him was a joke. And they, they missed a lot of opportunities. They just, they just they didn't want to find him. That's my opinion. Um, and and the, the thing that, you know, when, when it became a multi-agency task force, by that time the, the trail had gone cold. Um, there are some people who still believe that the FBI was, because they controlled the search, they, did, they still didn't want to find him. But it's really interesting, that the last chapter we have when he gets captured, we describe how the, this task force that at one time was like 12 guys and women is down to just two people, an FBI agent named Phil Torsney and a deputy U.S. Marshal named Neil Sullivan. And they are the two that put the strategy together, go looking for Kathy as opposed to looking for Whitey, and they found him within a year, but it was just two guys that did it. And so, um, and it was and it was important that it was somebody from the U.S. Marshal's office, absolutely, because for years they should have been. The FBI the was intransigent. It was about institutional turf, and they didn't want anybody involved in that search. They denied the chance to have the the U.S. Marshals. The U.S. Marshals, amongst the people that I know in the fugitive hunting business, had a much better reputation. And it was Neil Sullivan. And his entry, what, four or five months before, yeah, it wasn't that long. He, was the, he, was, he was the one who sifted and took the call uh, that night he after the, the, the tip. He recognized yeah. the significance And he said, this tip. is significant. Thank you. I, yes, I would want to just say yeah, that, in, that in fairness, I mean, you know, I spent some time, um, you know, over the years with talking to some of the people that were on that task force. And, and I do, I wouldn't paint everybody with this broad brush. There were people that really wanted him. I mean, at some point, there were agents, FBI agents included, on that task force who it would have been a great career maker for them to be the one to find him. And they had no allegiance to these guys that had been on the organized crime squad. But having said that, they still haven't really um, opened up the, the files to show why they didn't chase certain tips. I still haven't been able to find out why nobody called the guy who thought he saw Whitey at the Santa Monica Pier and reported it to, you know, America's Most Wanted it. It was turned over to the FBI. He never even got a call back. I found, I found something like six to eight tips uh, to America's Most Wanted that came within a quarter of a mile 
of yeah. where they found him. Uh, there was one yeah. in there was one in San Diego, uh, where a person at the train station, Amtrak, that should have raised a red flag right. because he had used Amtrak, where there was somebody that looked like him with a South Boston accent that wanted to send a package to South Boston or to and back here. He called, uh, and he was never visited by anybody. And so there are lots of these cases where people weren't visited. But Shelley's right. I mean, a lot of that stuff we still don't. By that see. time, Dave, it's hard. It, I, I believe in the beginning the search was corrupted. I believe, believe later it's hard to sort out what was corruption and, and what was incompetence. incompetence. It really is but, hard. Yeah, it, but, but just one, one quick story, uh, because Shelley talked to uh, Teresa Stanley a lot. Teresa Stanley was dropped off, unceremoniously mm -hmm. let go in 1996. Uh, the older woman being dropped off for a younger woman uh, to go on the road. So go back to Shakespeare, and detectives play things by numbers. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She was back on Silver Street in South Boston, what, two, three miles as a crow flies from the FBI office. They didn't get to see her for 18 months. When they talked to her, she gave up the one alias that one alias that they did not have, Thomas Baxter. And Thomas Baxter was uh, somebody who had a New York license, New York plates, and that car had been spotted elsewhere in the country, but it didn't come up. They did not have Thomas Baxter in the system. So that was the sort of stuff at the in, beginning. In June 1997, I wrote in the Globe, disclosed for the first time publicly that an FBI agent, and I didn't say it was me, I said it was a Globe reporter, because I was writing, a, I couldn't write a first person account, the, that an FBI agent called me at the Spotlight office um, at the Globe two months before we published the series that said that Whitey was a, a, an informant for the FBI. And uh, the agent said that uh, he was cute, because he said that he was calling because he had talked to his protected witness, Tony Chilla, and he said, this is a message from Chilla. He said, we know what you're working on. You're going to say he's an FBI informant. It's not true. And if you write that, he will not live, that, live with that. And he would think nothing of clipping you, which means murder. And then the agent, Tom Daly, said, especially you, Kevin, you live there. Now, Tony Chilla didn't know I live in South Boston, but Tom Daly did. Now, I put that in the paper in 97. and. Uh, a year goes by, I'm, I'm now the, um, I'm based in uh, Ireland full time, and in July of 1998, I'm, I'm sitting in the Crown Bar in Belfast, which is one of the finest establishments on earth. <laughs> and I was allegedly working, interviewing an IRA man, and my cell phone rang. It was an FBI agent in Boston. He said, we wanted to talk to you about that thing you had in the paper. I go, what thing I had in the paper? And he reads it back to me. I said, John, I put that in the paper 14 months ago. He goes, yeah, we're just getting around to it. <laughs> and I go, I'll tell you what, I'm busy. Click. Yes, sir. Oh, um, I was just wondering if, um, if you thought um, when Whitey Bulger comes to have his, his trial, if you think that he'll give some reliable information on some of the other accomplices that he's had that we might not know about, or you think he'll stay loyal to his men? He's loyal to one person, himself. I think he'll make all sorts, we actually put this in the prologue, we said he'll make all sorts of allegations. It's gonna be very hard to corroborate anything he says. I know that when he took off, there was rumors that he had tapes and stuff like that, but I, there's no evidence that he has. I think Whitey, like it's, you'll see, it's, all, it's going to be all Whitey all the time. It's Whitey's world. We're just living in it. So you'll see it at the trial. He, in his letters, he says that he calls it the show, the big show, the, the big circus. So, and that's what it's going to be. It's, the tent's not big enough for this one. <laughs> but I do think, I do think though, I'll, I will say one this, um, that I think it's really important that he get to trial and that he take the stand and we hear what he has to say. I know that um, you know the victims' families. They really want to hear what he has to say, and there is some concern that he's locked up 23 hours a day down in Plymouth, and he's 83, and you know back and forth to the hospital. And I just think it's really important that if he doesn't get to trial, there will always be this 
sort of the conspiracy theories that he had something he could have told us and they, they wouldn't let him tell it. So I think we all want to hear what he has to say. Whether we believe it is another question, but it's important he has, here. He has said that he's not going to, not going to testify against people that helped him. So he has, he has told people in the, in the system that, that, he, he, that he's not going, to, uh, not going to talk about the people who helped him and who he paid off. There'll, also, there'll be some payback. I also, thought, I also thought it was interesting because he told the same person I'm talking to, I have, I have, I'm having problems. I know I'm having problems with my short-term memory, but my long-term memory is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Last question, right? This is it. I don't know. Thank you. It's somewhat related. Do you think that Whitey Belger is mentally competent today to go through this process? I'm not a Good psychiatrist. Question. I just play one in my newspaper column. <laughs> Oh, well, as far as we knew, I mean, when he was out in California, um, Kathy was telling neighbors that he had early Alzheimer's, but that was simply uh, to account for why he wasn't out so much, you know, that he would only come out in the morning or later in the evening. And after bin Laden was caught, um, he really was hunkering down, and she was telling people that his Alzheimer's was really, you know, a problem. Um, but from the letters that I saw, and I've seen quite a few letters that he's written since he's been in jail, I'd say that there's, he's sharp as a tack. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with his uh, yeah, mental no capacity. I must say, though, the conditions under which he's held, I don't quite understand. Yeah. I don't know why he's locked up 23 hours a day. He, uh, the conspiracy theorists among us would suggest that the government does not want this guy to get to trial. Uh, he's 83 years old. Up until recently, he was doing uh, 155 push-ups a day in his cell and then writing furiously, and I'm sure he's thrilled that Shelley and I got a hold of his letters. Um, but I, I don't understand why you would do that to an 83-year-old guy if, in fact, you want him to be mentally competent, you want him to be healthy enough right. to stand trial. It doesn't make any sense unfortunately, to me. This is a, you know, unfortunately, this is, a, this is a, a, uh, an ongoing policy. The prison's more people in solitary than ever before. Right. John Connolly, yeah. John Connolly is in solitary, and. He's really deteriorated. Yeah, he's deteriorated quite and a bit. And in Charlie. fact, he talked, he talked, he broke a rule and talked to a reporter that wasn't on his list uh, last year and ended up going to solitary, extreme solitary, for 52 days. So yeah. there is. Yeah. Uh, I just yeah, got a, a letter that John had written to a mutual friend, and it, it, it really suggested a lot of uh, issues because he is locked up and it's, you, you wonder what that does no, and to I, people's and I, minds. And I will, too, um, you remember this because we were covering the, um, the hearings, you know, and the trials over the years, and Steve Flemmy, before he um, pled guilty to the 10 murders and started cooperating with the government and agreed to be a witness um, in the ongoing trials, like uh, he looked like he was ready <laughs> to die. They brought him into court, he was yellow, he was sickly, he looked like he was at death's door. As soon as he joined the government team, he looked like a million bucks. They'd bring him in. He looked Club 10 fed. years younger. He was eating well. He's waving to us from the, you know, the witness stand. So, I mean, I, I think that they need to do better by Whitey. I really do. He has, and I'm not saying this in a sympathetic way. I mean, I know he's charged with 19 we murders. to get to trial. He has not been to trial yet. He, why is, you know, to take an 83-year-old man, lock him up all that time, um, not letting him exercise, not letting him get out, no TV, no radio. I think he should be able to read our paper, don't you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. We um, need every subscriber we can get. <laughs> All right, we have to put the campfire out before the next saga is told. Uh, on, on behalf of the Kennedy Library, thank you so much. On behalf of Shelley and Kevin, thanks for coming tonight. There are books. There are books to be signed next door if you'd like one.